So one of our young people here uh, played a bit of rugby before uh, he joined our community. And he was describing how there were particular fellows who on the, the rugby pitch would absolutely delight in, for those who aren't familiar with rugby, there are a lot of occasions where um, dirty digs, so off the ball incidences where you can get kicked, bitten, gouged, punched, um, raked, if you've ever heard of raking, where you get to your football boots and you, you know, rake them off someone's calves or something like that, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. So in a, in a scrum where they, <coughs> where they uh, push against each other and that, all sorts of stuff goes on and the ref can't see much because everyone is there, well, there's a lot of people in there. So uh, it, get, it can get a bit messy because you're <laughs> <laughs> kind of, so a lot of stuff going on. And uh, there'd be some, some particular lads who just revel in the fact that they can just unleash their anger and start smacking, kicking, gouging uh, when, when, when the ref wasn't looking, you know? And what really boosted their confidence was the fact that half their family, their bigger brothers, uh, former rugby players themselves, were all on the sideline, right? So if you got raked by a fella and you wanted to kind of, <laughs> just kind of get a bit of revenge, you couldn't. Right? Because they knew, you knew that they had backup. Right? So then that, that's all fun and games on until in the changing room afterwards. We well, uh, saw you hitting my brother. Yeah, he raked my eye out. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you know, it would, uh, a discussion would ensue, which there would be negotiations. Um, one would sit down peacefully, and it would eventually, of course, end in a couple of swings. So not swings and slides, uh, the other kind of swings. So, okay, so bottom line, these lads would have great confidence because they knew they had backup. What if we can use that in a positive sense? What if we can use that kind of idea in a positive sense? Where if we know God is on our side, should this not give us much greater courage to do what he's asking of us? The idea that we are alone will absolutely paralyze us from doing anything. Uh, things that we know we're supposed to do, good things, virtuous things. If I think, like, you know, if, as a young person, and this does happen, uh, where oh, I'm the only one going to Mass, I'm the only young person going to Mass. So if I stopped, I mean, would it make any real difference? Would anyone really even notice? You know, the idea of, uh, when you're isolated, isolation is just horrific uh, when it comes to the, to the faith because people will not, they won't hold on or it's very much harder for them to hold on if they're alone. That's why right from the beginning when the Lord set up, sets up a church, I mean, it's always about community, people together. So when I'm going through a bit of a low period, there are people who can kind of lift me up, and then when they go through a low period, there are people I can pick up, and we walk with each other, we keep each other accountable, we pray for each other, support each other, we affirm each other, all that kind of thing. Very, very necessary, because no one is going to get it right all the time and just go from glory to glory and happiness to happiness and sanctity to sanctity. We, we, we need people to show us the way, uh, to be an example for us, to pray for us, to pick us up, to, uh, and, and so on. So, so when isolation is, is, is awful. In our reading, I just, the reason I'm saying all this is because uh, our first reading from the prophet Jeremiah, uh, there was just this line that really stood out for me anyway. The Lord is at my side, a mighty hero. The Lord is at my side, a mighty hero. I just thought that line was absolutely epic. Maybe it's a little child in me. Uh, but just like imagine you've got Jeremiah who was called when he was young and he says to the Lord, 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 I'm too young. I'm, I, I can't do this. Look at all these kind of scribes and Pharisees. And so they're older than me. They're more experienced than me. I'm just a child. I just, I don't, <laughs> they're not going to listen to me. The Lord puts his word into Jeremiah's mouth. Okay, so, so now Jeremiah has to do something which is awful, we've spoken about this a couple of times, that, that, that prophets could never win, right? If what you prophesy comes true uh, and there's some sort of a disaster, the people will accuse you, why didn't you tell us more forcefully? Why didn't you convince us more? Why didn't you, you know, start talk, talking to us earlier? Or then if the prophecy doesn't come true because the people do repent, then they will say, well, how do we know this is going to happen anyway? You said that we were going to get invaded unless we repent. We repented and then we weren't invaded. How do we know the invasion was coming? How do you know we just didn't make it up? So prophets simply could never win, right? Awful, absolutely awful. So that's why he's saying, I hear so many disparaging me, terror from every side, denounce them, let us denounce them. All those who used to be my friends, now watch for my downfall. 
you know, it's, it's a, perhaps he'll be seduced into error. Then we will master him and take our revenge. But the Lord is at my side, a mighty hero. So the context is awful, right? Uh, and a couple of things like that, that, that Jeremiah had to prophesy. He had to prophesy the destruction of Jerusalem. So this, 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 like this is their prize city, okay, in which is the temple, the, the prize location uh, within, within the, the city. And within that, then there's the Holy of Holies where God resides. So like Jerusalem, like this is, there was something, something, it's a wall city. They're proud of it. Like it's their homeland given to them by God. And now you have to come and say, this is going to be destroyed. No, it won't. This has stood for da, 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 years and the temple was built by Solomon. And, oh, no, so it's, it's not going to. He said, it will. It's going, we are going to be, this is going to be destroyed by forces which come from the north, which happened in his lifetime. The Babylonians came and the first deportations happened in, in 597 BC and then again 586. So the place was destroyed. And someone was asking me the other day, actually, what happened to the Holy of Holies, right? So the Ark of the Covenant, uh, where the Ark of the Covenant was, was held, what happened to it? During that Babylonian invasion, which destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem, the Holy of Holies disappeared and was never found again. So we don't know where it is. We don't know where it's like that. That was the end of, of this prized Ark of the Covenant. Uh, who knows? Maybe they knew an invasion was coming, so they brought it somewhere as far as they could and buried it, hoping to get back to it later, and then maybe they were killed. So then no one knew where it was. So we don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll discover it. Who knows? But point being, their most sacred artifacts, if you want to call that, like where the Lord resided, is this, this Ark of the Covenant with the, with the two cherubs over it. We lost it. It was lost. Okay. So, but the Lord is at our side, a mighty hero. He had to denounce... The fact that the Jews were slipping into, as happens so often, the customs of the people around them. And one of their customs was the sacrificing of children to the pagan god Moloch. So they would actually take their children and they would burn them. This was a, it was a, a local practice amongst the Canaanites in that, uh, that you'd sacrifice your children in order to have the blessing of a good crop or good weather or whatever it was. It's just very interesting. Uh, it's something that we've come across uh, on numerous occasions now in, in our studies of scripture recently that it seems when, when child sacrifice begins or, or is, is adopted, that's when God draws the line. That's when he says, enough, you've, you've gone too far. And isn't it interesting that we seem to keep going back to this point? You know, this, this happened uh, six, five, six centuries BC. And now we're back there again. Most people who watch this live stream, most are from Ireland, the good share from the UK, and, uh, and a good number from, from the States as well. And yet all of, these, all of these are beautiful, developed countries have now all legalized abortion. All of us. And I think this is the point where the Lord will say, enough. No more. That's, that's too far. That's too far. So he may have to bring about the destruction of our temple, you know, to bring down what we consider to be our... Our, our strongholds, what we consider to, to, to make us powerful, you know, <laughs> empty the banks and watch the chaos, you know? You don't have, we don't have a central kind of building that's as important as the temple was to the Jews, but our financial institutions are what we rely on for everything. It's what makes, you know, money's what makes the world go around. You stop the flow of money and boom, chaos. So it wouldn't be hard. It wouldn't be hard. And maybe even some might argue it's overdue. If we have turned our backs on God, if we allow the sacrifice of children in order for a certain lifestyle, then that's too far. That's too far. The Lord will not stand idly by. But the Lord is at our side, a mighty hero. Because for us who, who are pro-life, for us who are uh, Catholic and are, are, are again, not that we're better than anyone else, but we do have this, this gift of faith, thank God. It's going to be increasingly difficult to maintain our stance, our pro-life stance, our pro-Catholic stance, our pro, you know, all, all of the things that we believe uh, as regards morality, but not just. The, the way we live, the way we pray, all of these things. These are going to be increasingly attacked. Okay, We even see it within our own church where we have wonderful 
tried and tested beautiful devotions and more than devotions like Eucharistic Adoration and the Rosary and Stations of the Cross and uh, Divine Mercy Chapel that are a relatively new one in the grand scheme of things. You know, all these, these like God-given gifts, this is, this is how you can pray. These are good, effective ways of praying. And we go, great, but I prefer to do this, something else I've invented for myself. And you can imagine the Lord going, well, I, I've given you these gifts because they work. I've given you these tools, if you want to reduce them to tools, not, not a great term, but I've given you this way of praying because it works. Okay? So if you invent something of your own accord that doesn't have the same blessing, and depending on where it came from, it may not have any blessing at all. It may actually be doing you harm. Just use what works. You know, there's a particular place I know where uh, rather than the Stations of the Cross, they put up a, a cosmic walk. Okay, so you go for this walk around the park and it's got the cosmic walk. So, I don't know, there's chaos to creation and then, and it's all, that, that's made up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like, you know, where Jesus redeemed us through the Stations of the Cross, that, that, that's worth contemplating. Or, you know, through any of the decades of the rosary. And, and these aren't old hat or old school. These are tried and tested things. And I think, just very briefly, if I may, um, when it comes to tradition within the church, we have to stop associating tradition with negativity. I think that tradition is bad. Or tradition means stuck in the past. If you go to any of our Irish sports, right, they, the whole thing, beginning to end, is seeped in tradition. Right? Everything from the fact that we sing our national anthem in Irish, when I would imagine that, at best, one or two percent of the people there could actually write the national anthem, maybe even the first line of the national anthem, with no mistakes. In Irish. I would be, I would estimate maybe one in a hundred people could write the first line of the national anthem with no mistakes. Because, you know, but it's Irish. And so, so should we should suggest, and since people don't speak Irish, we should sing our national anthem in English? Could you imagine? <laughs> Imagine the uproar if someone were to suggest we're going to translate our national anthem, we're going to sing it in English now at the beginning of all of our games. People would say, how dare you? And our forefathers died for this language. Okay, okay, now transfer the same idea to mass. It's ridiculous that anything, anything would possibly be mentioned in Latin. That's just ridiculous and old school. But it's the same kind of idea. Right? This is, it's, it's showing our, our roots. The, the, our liturgy wasn't invented at the end of the council. This stuff goes the whole way back to Abraham and you know, the, whole, the whole way back to Melchizedek offering bread and wine and the Passover and Moses. Like it does, it, it's so rich. So yeah, it's okay to have a little bit of the occasional foreign language to remind us that our history is, is a long history. Or you know, the moment silence that you see at GAA games for GAA players or whoever they were who've passed away and the whole place, the 80,000 people will stand there kind of awkwardly, for a minute, and, and maintain the moment silence for the fellow who's passed away, and then, then the applause starts, and away we go again with the match, and then there are all the, the you know, all of the, 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 the songs for various teams, right? So, all the rebel songs there from the, from the Carconians, and, and uh, or like, you know, you see rugby games, and you've got the uh, swing low, sweet chariot from all these big Welsh men, you know? It's, it's a religious song. And should we suggest that you know, we, we change these things because they're, they're old songs? No. In fact, if anything, if someone were to invent some sort of a pop song, probably say, that's useless. You're like, you know, the fields of Athenry, we like these kind of older songs, you know what I mean? So the point being, tradition, tradition is actually, it's a good thing. We consider it a really good thing in sport. So also as regards our prayer lives, also as regards our church, tradition is a good thing. It stops us getting swayed every direction by new fads that people keep coming up with. Tradition is what keeps us rooted and grounded. It's a good thing. So the Lord is at our side, a mighty hero, and he's assisting us in prayer. He's teaching us to pray, and he's defending us from, dare I say, an ever-growing enemy, because as we hold on to these traditions and these teachings of the church, we're going to find ourselves in an ever-smaller minority. But I hope that like my wadi, as we get smaller, we get more concentrated, more and more concentrated, right? And then the Catholic Church there will be this like concentrated, super concentrated my wadi, that eventually then, when the Lord allows, when the Lord wishes, a whole pile of water will be added to us, and that beautiful sweetness will flood over the whole earth. <laughs> Never quote me on that. <laughs> 
But it's, that's how I think, I think as we get smaller, we'll get more and more concentrated. Like, the, like the, the, the people then in the church will actually believe what the church believes, actually pray what the church prays. And then the time will come for that to be, to be shared with the world. I think at the moment that we probably have to concentrate on just on getting ourselves straight. It's not, it's not really about numbers at the moment. It's about faithfulness. If you get the faithfulness right, the numbers will follow. But if you get numbers, increased numbers with, with decreased faithfulness, you have nothing. You have nothing. So the Lord is at our side, a mighty warrior, a mighty hero. So we pray for that same courage that Jeremiah had to stand for the truth. And if it's unpopular, it's unpopular. We get on with it anyway. We stand with the Lord. And ultimately, if we stand with him, he will always stand with us. And with God at our side, who can be against us? Amen.